Okay. Hello, 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 welcome everybody. Hello and welcome. I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger from DansFish.com, and we're gonna do this again. We do this every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 9 Eastern for those that don't know where the mountains are. And we're gonna chat, talk some fish. I'm pretty excited tonight because I'm gonna go over a ton of different species that came in on the import. Folks have been asking what came in. And so I'm gonna go over that in detail with you today. Um, all the fish that came in will be ready for sale um, Friday or Saturday. I should have them listed up. So either Friday or Saturday at the latest this weekend, we'll have everything listed. Candy Overholes, thanks for letting me know that the audio is good. Um, before we get into that though, we have a giveaway. We're going to give away some Denison Barbs or Roseline Barbs or Roseline Sharks, whatever you call them. Sahayadra Denisoni is the scientific name. I'm going to give away, I think I can fit three of those in a box. It might only be two, but I, I'm pretty sure I can get three of them safely in a box. So let's say three tonight, um, all in one group. So one giveaway of three Roseline Barbs. Before we do that though, we're going to get in the shipment report, which is very brief. As far as I recall, everything has been just fine since last we talked. So no problems as far as I know with shipping, everyone's arrived alive and in good shape. There was a hiccup, which is that um, for some weird reason, half of the fish that we sent out Monday were delayed, like a large number of boxes, about half of the, all the boxes we sent on Monday were delayed. And it's very strange, usually with UPS, the fish leave here and they go to Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, and that's their major hub and from there they go wherever but all the delayed boxes ended up in like Ontario, California. So I have no idea. I don't know if there was just an oopsie or if there was a problem landing at Memphis, like some kind of weather event. I checked weather.com and everything looked clear, but the good news is everything that was delayed um, arrived today and arrived alive and in good shape. We, we always pack in case there's delays. The fish are packed to last three to four days, even though they're shipped next day, just in case of stuff like this. And it usually doesn't happen, but this year, a little more than usual, unfortunately, and I'm not quite sure why, <laughs> but hopefully that's the end of it. Winter's ending, weather is getting warmer, so uh, hopefully delays stop being a thing. Although, you know, something I didn't think about is this time of year, sometimes there can be some flooding out in Memphis, Tennessee area, so I don't know if there was flooding, I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, they all arrived alive in the end. So that's the shipment report. All good in the end. I'm real sorry for anyone whose package was delayed. <clears throat> sorry, package was delayed. I know how inconvenient it can be when you've arranged your week so you can be home from work to get the fish when they arrive on Tuesday and everything. And then it's like, oh, never mind. Looks like for some reason they're not going to arrive till Wednesday. So I apologize for that. The good news is, though, that rarely happens. UPS has been pretty good about getting packages out on time so um, I just apologize for the inconvenience because I've been there and I, I know what that's like um, so with that let's get to the let's call it the import report um, which I totally ripped off from the column in Tropical Fish Hobbyist magazine <laughs> so I got to give credit to them for coming up with that title and I'm gonna go over a ton of fish people have been reaching out wondering what came in when will it be listed and all that so I'm gonna go over what came in and tell you the state of it um, there are a couple things that I'm not going to go over um, because I think they're, they're common enough fish that everyone probably knows them pretty much. So those are things like the blue avatar angelfish. Um, we did get more of those in. Really nice, beautiful blue version of an angelfish. Um, the the Denison Barb, I think almost everyone knows what those are. And the Gold Denison Barb as well, we got more of those in. Uh, which reminds me, I have to do the giveaway before I do this. So if you'd like to be entered to win three Denison Barbs, then all you have to do is in the chat enter hashtag Roseline. Because they're also called Roseline Barbs. And I figured that was easier for everybody to spell. So R-O-S-E-L-I-N-E, -E, if you type hashtag 
rose line, no space, all one thing in the comments here, then you will be entered to win three of those fish um, that'll send you. And right now, I'm looking at them right now. They're here. You can see them. I think. Can you? Can we see that tank? They're they're this tank right here behind the computer. You can see them swimming there. They're about I'm gonna say an inch and a half roughly in size right now. They're gonna get about four inches like these big boys behind me, but about about an I'm gonna say an inch and a half I think is just from here looking at them about the right size. Maybe a little bigger on a few of them. So if you'd like to win, hashtag Roseline. And at some point later today, we'll draw those. So with that, let's get back to telling you about everything that came in. Um, uh, a few quarries. I did try to get Equus. They, they did not come. Um, but I did get some Corydoras paleotis. I got them because I ordered the long fin. They don't appear to have very long fins to me. They're kind of medium, a little longer than your normal Paleotis Cori, but not those big long fins that you would expect if you got a long fin version. So I'm just listing them as a normal um, Paleotis when I list them this weekend. Um, got some long fin Aeneas, which are very nice. Got some Corridors Sturbi because we've been running low. Those are going to need an extra week though. They came in rough. And there were a few losses the first week, so I'm going to give them a, the, the stir by an extra week to recover to make sure they're okay before I ship them out. There haven't been any losses for, I think, over a week now, but um, I want to wait a little longer just to make sure. And then some more pygmy quarries. Those, those also will need another week. Um, got some clown killies in. Those will need another week. And um, I did get some empire gudgeons in, but... They have some weird like cotton ball fungus on them, or it might be bacterial. I'm trying to figure it out and treat them, but the Empire Gudgeons are not doing super hot. I'm hoping I can save them, but we'll see. I think that's all the problems though. Got that out of the way, so now let's um, show you the cool stuff. We're going to start with the gobies. We got a bunch of neat gobies in. This is the first one. It's stiffed on elegans, and they you'll see if you try to find images of these you'll find all kinds of different stuff so I don't know if this is the actual location I have or the actual fish I have but this is what they look like they look very similar to this we did get some more Annie A in however we only got a couple we have like two so very few Annie A but we did get some we did get a lot though of the Rutilarius which are in my opinion pretty much as pretty as the Annie. They're a beautiful, bright red goby. Um, you can see here a mix of the females don't have much color, but the males have this nice orange color. Um, they're, they're a really pretty fish. Peloensis, which gets this neat ba banded pattern on them. So this is actually a very good picture of them. I think this is true to them, although there's a little blue on them that isn't coming through. So what looks like black here is kind of a black, but it also has a, a navy blue sheen on it. A pretty good picture. Um, after Perpuensis, this is your neon blue neon goby, the one that's been around for a long time and that we're all pretty familiar with. But a great little starter goby, not too expensive, so I did bring some of them in for folks that want to start. And then this one, this next one is awesome. I only have one. They're extremely hard to get. This is the first time I've ever been able to get them. They came in at good size, around two inches, and they are so hard to find, you're not going to find pictures of them. This is as close as I could find. This is from a description of a different species that looks almost identical, just has some different fin ray counts and things like that. But this is pretty much the color pattern. Um, where you see bright orange here, I don't know if it's from the picture or what from the camera, but in the fish that I have, it's, it's actually more like a pink color, like a bright pink. So uh, when I do the video, I'll release a video um, right before I release the fish for sale so you can see the actual fish you're going to get. And when I do that, you'll hopefully it'll show up on camera. It's a really nice pink color. But um, super rare fish, and I was just so happy that any of them came. So we do have one. <laughs>
Croaking gouramis. The cool thing about croaking gouramis is a lot of people know the pygmy gourami or sparkling gourami. Beautiful little fish, looks very similar to these guys. But what I really like about croaking gouramis is they get bigger, so they get about two inches. So you get the color and personality of, I mean, it's a little different color, but you get the basic body color, personality, shape of a sparkling gourami, but in a larger size, a two inch size, in case you need a, a bigger fish. Sparkling gouramis are so small, they can't go with, you know, there's certain fish that will just eat them. We did get some Celebes half beaks. Um, I, I did try to get some more of the Tanga half beak in. Unfortunately, it did not come. They were shorted. Um, but we did get some good looking Celebes half beaks. And they're good size, uh, inch and a half to two inches or so, which is great. Um, we did get some more L201 plecos. That's these snowball plecos. Just really pretty, nice contrasting pleco. We got some 136 Bs in, and this is the picture that I found that they look most like, I would say. Um, this, is, this is pretty true to what they look like, the ones I have. And they're good size. They're probably four inches or more. Uh, right around four inches, I would say. So smallest one, maybe three, three and a half. Biggest one's about four. So they're good size. Um, we did get some King Tiger Plecos in, the L. 066, which is a, a big favorite. So we have some of those. And these look a lot like the um, 136B, but they have a very different head shape. This is the L262, and the head shape is very angular, almost like a triangle. Looks like a shovel tip. So a neat pleco. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut all these out because having all these tabs open um, takes up a lot of <laughs> bandwidth and I want the processing power to be freed up so that the video comes in in okay shape. Here's the next group. Let me get this. Uh, I'm trying to get this uh, to be the right size to display. Okay, here we go. So I got some more Bosmani. Um, I got some Atinjo in, which are awesome because instead of kind of that yellow and light blue color, they get a more of an orange color. I would not say like this. This to me seems like either there's some extra red lighting or there's a little saturation fixing in the photo. That's like bright, bright red. So they might get like that, but I've never seen it. But but something like this I think is is fairly accurate. They, they turn more of an orange than a yellow. Now, that depends on your lighting, it depends on their mood, it depends on what they're fed, but they're a really pretty fish. And another one that we have that is very similar is the Aves Creek. And the Aves Creek, I actually have a picture here. This is a picture of, um, oops, this is not the Aves Creek, hang on. I've got to find, I'm going to switch the screens here real quick so I can find the right picture. Wait, did I shut it down? Oh, I must have clicked out. Okay, just a sec. I'm gonna pull up a file here and grab, um, we're gonna do this this way. Okay. Yes. Okay, so here you go. So these are some Aves Creek Bozmani, or Avis Creek, I'm not sure. that. I um, sold to a customer a while ago and now they've grown up a bit and this is his picture of what they grew into. When I have rainbow fish they tend to be small, um, they tend to be two inches or less. I have a few that are bigger but most of them are fairly small. Rainbow fish really don't start to show their colors until they're oh two and a half, three inches. Once once they get four inches then, then it's really nice. Um, so. The fish I have for sale tend to range from an inch to around two inches, with a few exceptions. And so often when you buy them from me, uh, they don't have their color yet. And when I take pictures and videos, you're not seeing their color yet. So I really appreciate it when customers um, a few weeks later, or a few months later or whatever, send me a picture and like, hey, look at them now. It's so cool to see them grow and, and color up. Here's another picture of the same. These are um, Bozmane from the Aves Creek. Look at that nice dark 
this is a feisty feeling male, that nice dark color with that orange. They're just really pretty. And then another fish that we got in, which I have not been able to get a color of a nice colorful photo of because I sell them before they get big enough, are these. These are the Clausioensis, so Melanotania from Clausio Creek. Um, kind of like the devil's hole pupfish in that it has a very small distribution, just this tiny little sliver of a creek um, is where they're found. And here's another picture of them. So this is Melanotania. I don't know why I always want to take my mouse and like go around the fish. <laughs> It's like I'm working on them in Photoshop or something, but this is Melanotania uh, classioensis as well. So I want to thank Ryan for sharing those photos with me. Thanks so much. Um, another one that we got in that I'm really excited about because it's very hard to find, and I want to thank the folks at Rainbow Fish Live on Facebook for helping me um, get a good identification on these because they were misspelled. Uh, on the invoice and I just wanted to make sure that I knew what they were but we got these in so these are Melanotania um, from Oneli I think or Onali maybe but this is the fish and they're small they're only about an inch right now so they're not gonna look like this yet but it was nice of the Rainbow Fish Live folks to share uh, share that with me these I'm super stoked about. This is a Pseudomugil that, that is very hard to find. As, uh, how do you say that? Pelocetus, I guess. Just a very unique one. And then one that's similar is the Novagenie. And so both of those came in. They're both doing great. I cannot sex them, though. It's not for lack of trying. I've been looking at them for a week and a half, trying to see if I could sex them. I'm not going to be able to sex them accurately. I don't know these fish well enough. I've not seen any like big obvious differences. So I know that people that buy them are going to want pairs so that it can breed them. I'm sorry. I've tried. I, I don't know how to do that. So I can get you a group and hopefully end up with males and females. But I, I literally don't know how to sex these. I've looked and looked and I'm just not seeing anything that I feel like I can rely on to guarantee a sex. Um, so those I'm very excited about. Though. I've been trying to get these for quite a while, so it's nice for them to finally, finally come and be available. Um, this is a picture of the Melanotania. It's not been described yet, but it's from the location. The, the collection location is Caladiri. I got a nice big group in. I think I've got 16 or so of them, and they're like three, four inches. Um, I haven't found any pictures that show them when they're colored up and kind of fired but I do have a video on my YouTube channel of a previous batch I got in um, of them firing up and you see the big blaze up the top of the head but cool fish and they're big so if you don't want to wait for your rainbow fish to grow I've got I think about 16 of these they're all males and they're big and fully colored um, then we have some of the goldie eye from Kiura um, CF Goldie Eye, meaning I, I don't know if it's been determined for sure yet that they are in fact Goldie Eye. Maybe they have. Um, I don't know as much as a lot of you know true rainbow fish geeks that really follow every new change of nomenclature, but um, these are the Goldie Eye, if you will, <clears throat> from Kiura. We got in some more Glossolepsis. This is a, I love this location. Um, it hasn't been described yet, but it's from Gedoman Village. And I know that they have this beautiful blaze because I've seen it even in my young fish. Um, but the ones that I have are pretty much silver right now. They'll blaze up occasionally. They're just starting to get hints of this color, but it's going to be, they need to grow up a little bit before you really see their color. And then um, we're able to get some more of the Chilina. Chilotherina caliawalum, a nice blue fish. So, I don't know. Similar, I, yeah, I hate to say it's like Lasustris because it's just not, but um, it's a Chilotherina that's, that's blue. I got more of the Cali Hamas or Cali James or Cali Jamas, I'm not quite sure how to say it in as well, but those I cannot find a picture of. And my picture is just of like little silver brownish fish because they, they aren't colored up yet. So 
that's some of the rainbows we got in. Um, I hope you like rainbows because I have a few others to go over. I'm not going to go over the um, Neon Dwarf rainbows because we know what that is, or the Parkinsoni because we know what that is. But um, one that I do want to show you is these. So we got these, and these are Melanotania saluensis from Skull Creek. And I have this location, this actual fish. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. This actual location that you're seeing a picture of, that's what we have in. Uh, I like them because they have those nice black margins. It contrasted with that yellow. I think they're really, really pretty. Um, we got more Blair Eye in. We were able to get males, so I'll be able to sell those as trios. Because the last batch came in as all females. <laughs> um, oh, Melanotania Sembra. So I'm going to close down some of these just so that there's not as much drain on the system. Um, but Melanotania Sembra. This is one that I've been trying to get for a while. I've never seen in person before. So I was glad to get it in. So this guy. And this photo, I mean, I feel like the... Uh, this the clarity has been upped on it and stuff like that and it, it just looks a little off but that'll give you an idea of that fish um fasten creek so we did get some more some not some more for the first time we were able to get melanotania fasciensis in which this is a cool fish this is a nice bright orange fish um, from fasten creek show you some pictures um and if you don't support um, ANFA, it's a great website, lots of good information on rainbow fish, and it's a nonprofit, and they can use the help. So if you're, if you're someone that really enjoys rainbow fish and, and you use ANFA's website and all their information, uh, consider joining, consider you know, giving back a little bit to keep them going. But look at these. Uh, these are full grown and displaying, so that's kind of them at their peak. So I was really happy to get some Fossiensis in. Um, got some more Multisquamato, Glossolepis Multisquamato from the Membaramo River, or Mambaramo River, I think, is how you pronounce that. Three kinds of Trifosciata. I got the Cohen Rivers, the um, Goiter Rivers, and the Hapgood Rivers. All just spectacular Trifosciata locations. We talked about those I did get some Cura in. Um, already went over that. Oh, some Fasciata. So, Chilotherina Fasciata. And I'm not quite sure. I mean, I know. I don't think that any of these are going to be from that location. Um, if I remember right, these are the ones from Membaramo as well. So, here's some different Fasciata. The ones that I have, I know get a nice orange blaze, but I haven't ever seen them as adults. So any of you that got the the Chilotherina fasciata from me, um, oh, I haven't showed this. Sorry, I thought I was showing this. Any of you that got them from me, the previous batch, if you, I think that they're going to look something like this because I saw a lot of orange in them coming, but this is from Clearwater Creek, so completely different location. Anyway, if you got some from me before and they've grown up and colored out, I would be very interested to see what they actually look like um, when they're grown up. Because Chilotherina fasciata is one of the most widely distributed species of rainbow fish that there is. So there's a huge variety of colors and patterns and, and all that. And so I'm just not sure what the ones I have <laughs> look like as adults, and I'd like to know. I've never seen them as a, as adults. Um, we got some more Centeniensis in, which I think most folks are, are familiar with, Chilotherina Centeniensis. Um, so I think that's going to... Oh, I got the Macolachi from Starsh Creek, so this is worth showing. So the Macolachi and the um, Saluensis... One of the nice things about these saluensis I showed you is that they, they don't get big. They top out at, does it tell us right here, maybe a couple inches. Um, well, I can't remember if it's two and a half inches or three inches or something, but they don't get very big, which is nice. For, for a lot of tanks, you just don't have room for a four or five inch 
uh, full adult size rainbow fish, but two and a half, three inches, you know, you can do. Um, but the Macolachai from Starch, Starch Creek, um, Macolachai are just such beautiful fish. Let's see if we can find some from Starch Creek. They look very similar to these, just more red in the tail when they're adults. Yeah, it doesn't have a picture of the exact location, but nice little fish that looks very similar uh, to this, but with more red. I think that's going to do it um, for... Oh, and I haven't been showing this. Jeez, I'm the worst at my job. Here you go. That's what I've been talking about. <laughs> I'm the worst. Um, so that's going to about do it for the rainbow fish. I did get some other ones in, but I, I don't want to overtax the system, so I don't want to show everything we got. I'm just trying to show some highlights. Okay, so here's the last page that I'll show you, and then we'll get to questions and comments and all that good stuff. And hopefully you're enjoying this. I know it's taking a while to get through all this, but folks have been asking, so, and I promised them I would do this, so we're doing it. Um, we did get some more CPDs in, Celestial Pearl Danios. I won't know for sure if they're ready to go Friday or Saturday until right before. They're looking good now. I think they're going to be fine, but they're, they're fairly small. And I just want to make sure that they're kind of big enough and, and fat enough to go. So right now I think they're getting fat enough, but I'm going to have to kind of really take a close look and see how big they are. I don't want to send like quarter inch fish. So, but they're doing well, they're healthy, no, no problems. We did get some uh, Kubo Thai Rasboras, which is a nice neon green Rasbora. More of the orange Lemon Tetras out of Bolivia, uh, a new location they found, which has bright orange color. Similar to the standard Lemon Tetra we all know and love, but just a little different. Molanostichos, I think is how you say this. <laughs> nice blue. Um, Tetra, fairly new to the hobby. And then I also did get in the Bonita Tetra, which is a lot of blue with a lot of black on the tail, but I couldn't find a, a picture of that. Um, here is one folks have been waiting for. This is the Blue Congo Tetra, is the common name. So this is a, a West African species, not a South American species. Lots of iridescent blue on it, and they get the males get these long filaments on the dorsal, um, ventral, and anal fins. There's a good picture of it. Nice extensions there. So, neat fish. And we did um, try for some licorice garamis. So, I've been wanting to do licorice garamis for a while, but I've been a little hesitant just because. Um, it's a bit of a gamble when you do like those real soft acidic water species. But I'm happy to say that we did get, I tried one species, um, uh, the Dysonerii. And the reason I brought this one in that you're looking at is because it grows larger than most licorice garami. So these guys get about an inch and a half or so, maybe a little bigger, which is giant for a licorice garami. And I just thought that most folks would want something a little bigger than a you know 0.75 inch fish uh, full grown right now they're small but they'll grow to inch and a half maybe bigger and so I did bring them in they're doing great I'm glad I brought them in no problems um, they're starting to color up they're settled in they're still small they're under an inch right now they're eating pellets they're starting to eat flakes they love baby brine shrimp of course so they're doing fantastic um, then the last one that I want to show you that I forgot to find a picture of, I'm in love with this fish. Um, this is a gudgeon. Let me get this name. Okay, so these are the Mogunda Singulata. Gurnda, maybe, um, one of the sleeper gobies. This species only grows to about three inches, so it doesn't become a giant. It's not, it's a totally different species than the purple spotted gudgeon, uh, Morguna, Morgunda, Morgunda, and all those. 
and they have a lot of color on them. Top out at about three inches. They are, uh, let's see if I can find a good picture. <laughs> oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, neat little goby that I've kind of fallen in love with. They remind me of an empire goby or a, um, or even even a peacock goby, but bigger and um, robust fish. So these you don't want to keep with small, timid fish. They'll eat them or harass them. So I would say that they would go well with fish that are fairly good sized and are quick swimmers, um, but they're they're gonna harass. I wouldn't keep them with like a wild type betta or something like that that's kind of slow. I would keep them with something fast and robust, maybe a barb, um, maybe some kind of larger danio, things like that. A rainbow fish, I think they would get along with just great. So that's most everything. We did get a few other things in, but uh, that's that's the stuff that's, that's I think the most interesting. Whew. So Oh, HC Aqua says they'll go with Congo Tetras. Yeah, so large, larger Tetras, things like that. A absolutely. So I don't want to say that they're they're not like a, I don't know, when you think of a piranha or something, a bloodthirsty fish, but they will, they will definitely pick on slow fish, and they'll definitely, like if your fish has long flowing fins, that could be a problem. Um, or if it's small, it's probably going to become a snack. But... I think they can go well with lots of fish. They just need to be big and bold, pretty much. And by big, I'm not talking 10 inches, just big enough to hang with a three inch fish, <laughs> with a robust three inch fish with a big mouth. Yeah. All right, so whew, 33 minutes, but we did it. I hope that was interesting to folks. Um, uh, and, but we're done, we got through it. So the plan is, um, I'm hoping by Friday, but it might take me till Saturday, there's a ton to do, to um, have these all listed, to do a tour video where you, you just, you know, quick dirty tour video, no fancy editing or anything, where you just go tank to tank and you see the actual fish we talked about today. Um, and a lot of them, like I said, the rainbow fish, you know, talking small and they're just going to look like silver little blobs, brown little blobs. But um, part of why I wanted to do this today was to show folks um, their potential because they really do grow into some stunning, stunning fish. You just have to be a little patient. So with that, let's get to questions and comments. Um, I see one here from Blake, and then I'm going to go up and do the rest. Blake Adams says, how does your fishing your fishing fee, your shipping fee structure work? For example, if we wanted nine rose lines, would that be three boxes and thus 90-ish in a shipping fee? Is that the only option when shipping larger fish? So I ship three sizes of boxes plus a wholesale box if someone does a really large order. Every now and then I'll send a big wholesale box instead of smaller ones. There's two sizes of bags I generally use. You're asking for the larger bags like the rose lines. So in a small box, I can ship three of the larger fish. I mean, there's a few fish that are so big it's only one, but let, let's say it's a, like a two inch rose line barb. I can ship three of those in one small box, UPS next day air for $29.50. I can ship seven to eight of those in a medium sized box and the shipping for that is $34.50, and I can ship um, 12 of those in a large box for $39.50. So small box, $29.50, medium box, $34.50, large box, $39.50, uh, UPS overnight, next day delivery um, is how that works. And then uh, if someone orders a ton of fish, then I move it up to a wholesale box. If I think that'll save them money, uh, depending on the type of fish and the weight and all that. Okay, I'm scrolling up. I'm gonna get to your questions and comments now. So if you have a question or a comment for me, if you would, basically how we do this is if you make it bright orange for me, see this nice, 
bright orange box around dance fish that means that Brian put an at symbol and then dance fish and he selected dance fish from the pop-up box and so his comment highlighted for me that's what I look for when I'm scrolling up and down um, this is as far as I can go up to Rico Stan saying hi to fishy and tank dicks and um, to let's see what's something easy to find to Brian with his red highlight <laughs> that's as far up as I can see um, so if you left a question or comment before and it's above that I can't see it, I can't get to it, so I would invite you to um, put it down again so that I can see it as I go through. Tasty fish sauce, good to see you. I have like a Tinjo rainbow fish and they're an intense in color from a young age, especially five minutes after the lights go on in the morning. Yeah, millennium rainbows are nice too. Yeah, there's a lot of rainbow fish that the lights go on and they immediately color up. That's like a cue for them to color up and start, I don't know, trying to display and enforce their territory and attract the females and all that. Yeah. Tasty Fish Sauce, thanks for the comment. I appreciate it. Uh, Monster Fish Gal says, any pea puffers? No, but oh, how did I forget? I do have Shodeni puffers. I totally forgot those from the list. I have, um, I think about 15 Shodeni puffers. They're doing fantastic. Um, this is the Congo Spotted Puffer, and they're eating really well on frozen bloodworms. They like scuds, but they're also starting to take viber bites. I would say that about half the group is, is eating viber bites, and each day one or two more is learning to eat them. So they are trained over to viber bites, kind of 50% trained, I would say. And they're doing fantastic. I've had no problems with them whatsoever. So no pea puffers but I do have some Shodeni puffers and we still have some Amazon puffers available as well that are doing absolutely fantastic and they eat snails and frozen foods and they absolutely jump on Viber Bites they love them I've had them longer so they're better trained but no pea puffers I'm sorry I sold out of the pea puffers and did not get any in this order Hoon Aquatics, the Membrano Fasciata should look similar to the Foe Village in Pagai Village since they are from the same drainage. Okay, that's good to know. Awesome, Hoon Aquatics, thanks. Yeah, Hoon's one of those that knows a lot more about some of the specifics of the collection points and um, all the nomenclature stuff more than I do. So I appreciate you uh, sharing that with me because I kind of have a general sense of them, but... There's so many fish that I have to know that it's hard for me to go way in depth on any one, one variety. Brian Klimazuski, are your M Park and Sonai the orange or the yellow variant? So they're the orange. Um, so for those that are wondering, I believe they're the orange. You know, now that now I'm gonna have to go look, but I think so. There's this yellow variety, right? And then there's this kind of this orange variety. Um, mine, if memory serves, are the orange. Why am I second guessing myself on that now? Pretty sure, Brian, that they're the orange. Jax in tax. I have a question about Get Gills member. I wonder if there's any way to contact them as I placed an order and seem to have not received communication. Um, yeah, absolutely. So let me show you how to do that. Let's say that you're going to get gills. So in the email that you received to confirm your order, there should be a, uh, an email address to the seller there that you can t contact. Um, but you can also go to get gills, click on stores. And let's say you wanted to get a hold of all things fish. Then you would click there and view store details and there's this field here that you can um, fill out your email address your name send them a message and this is an email that would go to all things fish and uh, land in their inbox so if you go to visit their store on get gills click details you can send them a message if you can't find um, the original email that has their contact information in it and I'm sorry if you placed an order and haven't heard from someone um, you know sometimes stuff goes to spam folders or gets lost but hopefully if you reach out to them you'll 
get an answer within a day or so and, and get that all taken care of. Most sellers do a great job. Every now and then there's an issue, but in the two and a half years, three years, two and a half years, the Get Gills has been active. I think there's only been three folks, maybe four, three or four that we've been like, okay, this is like the third time someone's emailed me and said, hey, I ordered and I emailed three times and I never heard back. So I, I, we just closed those stores down um, when that happened. So if, yeah, I mean, we don't want to know every little drama thing. I mean, the, the sale is between the purchaser and the store and get gills is just the platform. It's the flea market where all the booths are set up basically. Um, but if you bought something and you've emailed three times and it's been a week or two and you haven't heard anything, um, then it doesn't hurt to just send me an email, dan at getgills.com. Just let me know because that way, if several people do that, then I know that this is an issue and I need to take care of that store. There are times though when perfectly good sellers that I know that do a, a really good job, just something slips by them and they, it was like, oh, I just, it, somehow I didn't see that or um, it went to my spam filter or something. So usually it's just a oopsie, but every now and then it's a problem. And the main, actually, I guess the main way to do this is the feedback mechanism. It, leaving honest feedback on your experience um, on Get Gills with each store you deal with is really helpful because then if someone is a bad actor, you know, then their feedback reflects that. So that's really the, the kind of self-regulating mechanism on Get Gills. So, so let me say this, hopefully this is a glitch and that person's going to get back to you and, and it just be like, Oh, sorry, somehow it got marked as red. So I missed it or whatever. I've done that where I just accidentally click the wrong thing and don't realize it. Um, not often, but you know, every now and then my fat fingers do something. Um, hopefully it's all resolved. But what I would say is if you email them a few times, you don't hear back, then we don't have any direct control over them as far as their finances and their policy and stuff. But if you start feeling like this isn't going to work out, then I'd recommend contact your bank uh, to have them reverse the charge and just leave honest feedback on that transaction. So you'll get your money back and um, in the community will be made aware that there might be an issue on this store. So um, yeah, and, and of course you can reach out to me if you need to. Brian. Maramba, are you getting more rainbow shiners and how about rainbow darters? Oh, I have rainbow shiners. Are they, did they sell out? Hang on, let's take a, let's take a look, see here. Um, if they sold out, I need to list some more. Oh no, there's still some for sale there. So I do have rainbow shiners says I only have seven though so I'm gonna boot that up to 20 because I know I have more yeah so if you go to get gills um, and you put in rainbow shiner there they are so we do have some available Rainbow darters, I don't have any in. Um, and I'm not sure when I'll be able to bring in more rainbow darters or orange throat darters or what have you. I honestly think it'll take me going on a collecting trip for that to happen. Or if there's someone that, you know, has access to rainbow darters or orange throat darters and things like that, and you can collect a bunch and mail them to me and that's something you know how to do, then I'd be interested in talking. I like those fish a lot. It will need to be though from a location that, let's take the orange throat darter. That fish has a very wide, excuse me while I, I, I look at the chat, I'm just scrolling up because it jumped on me. Um, orange throat darters have a, a wide, wide range from pretty far south on up to, I don't know if they go up to the Great Lakes, but you know, pretty far north. I think they go up to like Michigan if I'm right, and down to 
are they in Alabama? I know they're in Missouri. Um, so ideally, it would be from a location down in the south because those tend to be warmer and uh, the, the habitats they're in are easier to mimic in the aquarium. So we keep our aquariums generally warmer than the water in the creek up in Michigan, right? So southern fish tend to do better in aquariums just because they can take more heat. Some of those northern mountain streams are awful cold year-round. Orange cones, the injured spotted headstander seems to have recovered 100%. Awesome, I'm glad to hear that. Hopefully he learned far well of fry or not tasty treats. Yes, orange cones. Cheers, I'm glad that he recovered. Um, so for those that don't know, orange cones is breeding far wells and had a whole bunch of babies and one of the spotted head standers decided that looks like a tasty treat and bit one and of course it went Voom! put out its spines and got stuck in its mouth or in its throat and so we were scared there would be an issue there but I'm glad to hear that that poor little spotted puffer <laughs> recovered <laughs> and the <laughs> that glutton is is back FNS fish room. Hi, what are the yellow and red fish behind you? These are golden denison barbs. Um, those guys right there. And um, we will be listing some of those for sale on Friday or Saturday. I have about, I think I have about 15 that I can list this weekend. Mega Mindy Lou, are you allowed to have personal tanks in your house? Show tanks to enjoy while you're with the family. Um, I. I could probably do that, but honestly, I don't want another tank to take care of, to tell you the truth. This is my show tank right here, and I'm down here so much, you know, um, or up in the annex so much that if I had a tank in my living room, I'd hardly see it, to tell you the truth. So right now, I, I've got my fill. So, nope, no... I mean, they're all my personal tanks, I guess. But, no, this is plenty. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Deb Hall D, I love your stock reports, especially with pigs. All right, I'm glad. Because I'm sure some folks were like, oh my gosh, when's he going to be done? <laughs> Skipper's Aquariums, to ask a question type, at Dam's Fish, so it highlights for him, exacto mundo. And Skipper's Aquariums, punchy paints, candy overhauls, and Cares Aquatics, and um, Lumpy Dog. Um, thanks to all my mods, thanks for everything you do, especially the ones that are here tonight, working for free, volunteering their time to make this stream work. I really appreciate you guys and everything you do for me and for the Fish Fam community. Thanks for being here. Mickey M, or was it Mikey M? I think it's Mickey M. You told me once and I've forgotten, I'm sorry. Did you get any nice Aphiosimian or Fundalopantec species? No, this order was not out of West Africa. This order came from Indonesia. Um, I did get some clown killies, but they're going to need a little more time to settle in. They're actually doing pretty darn good, but they're small enough and things that I, I like to give them a little time before I sell them. Um, but that's all I got. I, I ordered Garden Rite and I ordered Clown Killies, which were all the Killies that this particular su supplier had available. All I got was the Clown Killies. Um, I am hopeful that hopefully sometime in April we'll be able to bring in the West African shipment and get some, some Killie fish. Monster Fish Gal, good to see you. And uh, asking if we got any pea puffers in. I'm sorry we did not. Um, Kids Aquatics, telling folks how to get it to highlight for me. Thank you, Bob. Eric, why rock? Why not? <laughs> Besides baby brine shrimp and cyclops, what would you feed pencil fish? Oh, all kinds of stuff. Um, now, it depends on the species. Are they... I assume these are a downward oriented pencil fish we're talking about. Um, they'll eat algae wafers. They'll eat. So the key with pencil fish is they're a pretty slow feeder, right? So if you have a, some pencil fish in with a bunch of zebra danios, 
they're not going to get enough food because the zebra daniels will zip around and eat all the food before they can touch it. So you want to keep them in a mild tank with mild species that don't feed super fast. And they need quite a bit of dwell time. They need a lot of time, time with their lunch to eat it because they eat so slow. So like algae wafers, carnivore pellets, larger pellets that sink, they'll learn to go down and, and just kind of scrape on them for 10 minutes um, all together in a big group. And they'll mob it basically and just kind of scrape on it and eat little bits. And after about 10 minutes or so, they'll, they'll actually have gotten a meal. Whereas other fish can just zip around and in a few seconds they've filled up. But yeah, baby brine shrimp for sure, cyclops for sure. But anything, I think you can train them to pretty much anything they can fit in their mouths. You could do tiny little crushed up flakes. You could do little, little nano pellets. Um, you could do rapashi. But I think picking it a larger thing over time is pretty intuitive for them. Now, one area this can get tricky is if you have a lot of gravel or something, then and you're feeding a lot of sinking little fine pellets, that can all get down in the gravel and just rot. So a large like algae wafer or something, that'll still eventually fall apart and go down in the gravel, but for a while it'll stay there above the gravel where everyone can eat on it. So that's my thoughts, Eric. T-Fish, any recommendations on keeping peacock, I think it's gudgeons, in a planted 20 gallon? Uh, before I get to that, I just want to make nanostomus. Did I? I want to make sure I didn't. Nanostomus. So I was thinking of nanostomus equus in this, in this comment. Um, for the Beck Ford eye. For some reason, see, I was wondering if I was doing this. For some reason, in my head, I had them as downward oriented. Um, these are upward oriented. So a large floating pellet then, something that floats for a while. So just reverse that, sorry. In my head, I must have been thinking headstanders instead of upward pointing pencil fish. Okay, now that I caught my little kerfuffle there. Um, T-Fish, any recommendations for keeping peacock gudgeons in a planted 20 gallon? Looks like my males killing each other off. Lots of pipes, currently two males and three females are left. T-Fish, I've heard of aggression in male peacock gudgeons, but I've never experienced it. And I've kept hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands and thousands of peacock gudgeons over the years. So I don't know. I've never seen such aggression in peacock gudgeon males that they were actually killing each other. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It could be a very valid thing that happens, but I don't have any experience with it. So I guess the question would be, are you actually seeing it happen? Or is a male that's dead and we're assuming that that's what killed it? If you have tons of pipes and stuff and everyone has room for their territories and things, then in my experience, I've never seen that type of aggression. Heather Body Smith, hi, how many Mexican dwarf crayfish can you safely put in a 20 gallon tank? I've never kept Mexican dwarf crayfish, so I'm not the correct person to give an answer on that. Um, I would say lots, but that's just a guess because I have no experience with them. Someone here, if you've kept Mexican dwarf crayfish, um, could you chime in and give a more informed answer to Heather than I would be able to? And when you do it, if you wouldn't mind putting at Heather Body Smith so that it highlights for her, um, that would make it easy for her to find the answer. Swamp Thing throwing down two bucks. A juicy worm for your lonely Sikiopus. Thanks. And they do love worms. They like frozen brine, uh, brine worms, <laughs> frozen blood worms, and stuff like that. Um, they do seem to be more of a carnivore than a grazer. I know they graze, but when I put the blood worms in, some of the gobies just kind of go over and kind of graze on them. But the Sikiopus, especially the uh, multi squamata, that thing goes over and just starts going to chow town. So thank you for the. Uh, for the worm fund, I appreciate it. <laughs> Where else can you get a super chat, you get money for worms and be all excited? I guess maybe a, 
uh, like a rod and reel fishing channel. But <laughs> John Cox, did you ever get in Killies? I do, but I didn't this last order. Peplin Creek Aquatics, have you set a price on the gold rose lines yet? Um, I don't. I won't have. I have a pretty good idea what it'll be, but I'm not releasing any prices until the fish are actually released. But I think, just to give you an idea. I think those are going to be around the $40 range, give or take a bit, um, off the top of my head. Kyle's Aquarometrics, any Ninja Gobies this time around, or are they fat and sassy and ready to party? Oh, yeah, so I I didn't have any Ninja Gobies. So on all the Gobies, um, hang on, let me get a little visual demo so that folks that don't know the details of that can follow along. I'll be right back. So had a bunch of gobies escape last time I brought some in and I couldn't figure out why because I have one of these on all the overflows. And then, let me see if I can get this where it'll focus. And then when my brother was here, I was telling him about the problem and I've shown him these and he's like, well, did you see that? And he pointed to this, this one little gap right between the back of this um, overflow strainer and the first rib of it is a lot bigger than the rest of these and I was looking at these in tanks so I wasn't noticing that I, I just thought they were all the same size so this one is big enough that I was like hey maybe they were getting through there so this batch on all the goby um, tanks at least the smaller gobies I put a sponge over this thing so there was no way for them to get through there and I haven't had any problems so I think that must have been what happened um, which kind of tears me up inside thinking <laughs> thinking that I made a mistake like that but thankfully we did find the problem so it won't happen in the future but yeah no one's no one's ninja out on me um, everyone's still there all right Lunatic Fringe. Ever heard of Wallace Acromus? Yeah, um, I don't know about that specific species. Let's look. I'm familiar with those. I think those are the West African species. So what is this Rubro labiatus? These guys. I, I've heard of Wallace Acromus. I, I'm not very familiar with them. I haven't kept a lot of them. Um, so I can't really give you any information on them. Uh, lunatic fringe says I have been oh and I didn't share it here they go that's what I was looking at I've been looking at some of the other genus of cichlids from West Africa that Oliver Lucanus has and there are many small cichlids that he's not seen before cool yeah Oliver is a good guy I think Oliver um, I think Oliver does it right so unfortunately I I do have access to quite a few neat African cichlids from West Africa, um, but it's going to be a while before I'm going to be able to get them in. The only ones I expect from the Nigeria order are like uh, Sacramontis, uh, a couple Hemichromis species, but no Wallace Acromis, no Nanochromis, or anything like that. Alicia A.S., did you decide on the sex ratio for the blue Congos? Yeah, I looked and there's both, but it's female heavy, so I'm not going to be able to sell any individual males. I'll need to sell them um, in probably trios, one male, two females, um, just because I have more females than males. It's not terrible, but it is skewed heavy female-wise. I mean, there are times when all you get is females or all you get is males. Like <laughs> like the Blair Eye, I was so excited and then I got them and it's like, oh, there are two males and 25 females. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen True Seeker, do you ship outside the United States? I do not, and I, and I won't be doing that for quite some time. I'm sorry. Um, it, it's just not something we can handle right now in our current growth mode and everything we're, we're taking care of. But we are aware that it's something that people would like us to do, and we will figure out a way to do that in the future, but I don't know when. It'll be a while. 
Hey, Danny, Ken, how are you guys doing? Hope you're doing well, Danny and Ken. Big Yak 35, any advice on pado pagoda snails? I ordered some. That's another one I've, I've never kept, so I, I can't help you with that. Um, folks, if you've kept, I always want to say padoga. If you kept pagoda snails, um, would you give Big Yak 35 some advice? Because I don't know enough about them to be helpful. Jackson Tax, thank you so much. Hey, you are mostest welcome. Jerry Serple Morris, Jerry, good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Just got a small group of neon dwarf rainbows to breed. My quarantine is currently being used. Would splitting the rainbows into two groups of three in five gallon buckets be okay for quarantine or is that too small? No, I, I think that that could work. However, I want to put a big caveat on this. Generally, what I've found is when you try to do that and you start getting out of the normal system and oh, I have a container here and over there and up there, um, it, it starts to get pretty hard to take proper care of the fish. Uh, in buckets, you can't really see through to see if there's a problem. You can only look down. Oftentimes, a bucket will be like a bright white color or a bright orange color if it's from Home Depot or something, which isn't maybe the best color for surrounding a fish. Um, I mean, there are things you can do. You can get some like plastic totes and do it in there because you can set those up, you know, just like a normal aquarium. They're pretty much a normal aquarium shape. So before I did like a five gallon round of bucket, I, I would look at some kind of plastic tote it was the same dimensions pretty much as is an aquarium. Um, buckets are kind of high volume versus low surface area. And you want more surface area generally in an aquarium. So can it be done? I think there's a way to do it, Jerry, but I wouldn't recommend it, honestly. I think that it would, uh, I think there's a lot of easy problems that you would run into with just like a, a Homer bucket from Home Depot or something. Paul Soltero, UPS redirects traffic from your part of the country to Cali when Louisville is under weather alert or extremely high volume. Paul, do you know if there was a, an issue? Did they get like a sudden flood or something? I, I did Google for, I, I don't know, a couple minutes. I, I didn't have a lot of time to look into it, but I did a quick Google search just to see if anything popped up and I didn't see anything. But uh, thanks for Thanks for letting me know. Um, so either bad weather or so much volume that they couldn't handle it, <laughs> it sounds like is what happened. I wonder if there's a flood. It, it feels like end of winter, if there's a big rain and it melted all the ice and snow, plus you had a bunch of rain that you could easily have a flood this time of year um, in Memphis. The Midnight Lobster, you need dance for stickers. I've got a few. I've still got some of these. The uh, Breeding is Pleasure sticker. So, uh, is that... Where does this thing focus, this camera? <laughs> does that do it? No, the focus is way back here, isn't it? I guess that's good. That's where my face is. Um, so, if, uh, if you want a sticker, let me know on your order. Just leave a note. I want a sticker! And I'll throw one in there for you. All right, let's go ahead. Oh, chat just jumped big time. Boom. Yeah, Paul Soltero saying Equus and Beck 40 eat very differently. Absolutely. My Beck 40s drive right in with the other fish and Equus are much more deliberate eaters. Yeah, yeah. My mind was like, I don't know why I was confused about upbound versus downbound oriented pencil fish. But you're right. The Beck 40 are... are uh, they're almost like a normal tetra once they figure things out. They jump right in. They still have a small mouth, though, so it takes them a little longer. But um, they eat a lot quicker than, say, an equus. Wow, chat jumped so far. I'm looking for the top here, guys, because uh, we fell behind. There it is. I just saw Paul Soltero's comment about UPS and the Midnight Lobster. Okay, we're back. Now, I think what we want to do is let's go ahead and do the giveaway. We have 212 folks here. So um, in about five minutes, I'm going to do the giveaway. So if you know that your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend um, really wants Denison Barbs, 
reach out, let them know. <laughs> In a couple minutes, we'll do this. RB Animals and Collectibles, do you have any bettas? Yeah, I have um, Betta Chinoides, Betta Brownorum, Betta Edithae, Betta Anabantoides, um, and some Betta Forshi. Now, I just moved the Betta Forshi to a different tank, so I need to give them a little bit of time to make sure that they settle in before I list them for sale again. Um, and the bed of brown orum, I need to list again. I took the bed of brown orum off because um, they came in with really bad tails, like their tails have been hurt. I don't know some, I don't know where or when that happened, but when I got them, the tails were pretty. Uh, what's the word? Frayed on the edges, and so I only listed a few because a few of them had good tails. And I've been waiting for the other one's tails to kind of heal up and grow out, and that's happening. So I have I have an, another group of them that are probably ready to go, and then it'll be a little while for more to recover. It just they all recover at different rates, is and it doesn't appear to be an illness or anything. It it appears that just I don't know if they were all in a bag together in a tight space, um, and they got feisty with each other when they were being shipped or, or what happened, but. It's taken them a little time to recover from that. But I think all the other ones are listed and they're all doing great. Um, the Anabantoidus is awesome. It's a, it's a pretty large fish and very personable. The Edithae are cool. Oh, I also have Rutilarius. Do I have those listed? Or I always say Rutilarius, that's the Gobi. Rutilins, better Rutilins. I also have some of them. Let me see if they're listed here. I used to always say Rudolins. Yeah, there's a couple left. Um, and then I got the the Rudolarius gobies in, and ever since I've always said better Rudolarius instead of better Rudolins. <laughs> Big Yak 35. I love rainbow darters. Well, you have good taste. They're beautiful, awesome, amazing fish. Stefan Truth Seeker, what about having a get gills in England? Yes, um, absolutely. So, Get Gills is currently set up for England. Um, I think there's 52 countries right now that Get Gills can service. We just haven't had anyone from England set up a store yet. But if you or anyone else in England, um, any of your fish friends, want to use Get Gills, it's set up. It, it should be able to... You should be able to, when you sign in, say, select your country, England, set up your store, and sell to folks in England. Yes. So it's it's ready. It's just waiting for someone from the United Kingdom to go ahead and start the first store over there. F and S Fish Room. In, in Stefan, if, if you would be so kind to try it and try to set up a store there even if you don't have anything for sale um, and let us know if because I don't know that the details like how do you enter an address in England is it different uh, you know state versus province all, all that kind of stuff so um, if you wouldn't mind setting up a store even if it's just a dummy store to test it and letting me know if there's anything we need to change to make it more friendly for someone from England who wants to set up a store, like if we need to change a format or add a field or, or something so they can set up properly, then that would be helpful. Um, so we could get get things optimized for folks across the pond. <clears throat> FNS Fish Room, I can't ship to Ontario, Canada, I'm sorry, just in the United States right now. However, Get Gills is also set up for Canada, so if folks from Canada want to use it, it's there ready for them. I just got to Swamp Thing to the Super Chat. I'm so far behind. Let's do this giveaway, and then we'll see how far we get. <laughs> okay. So this drawing is for three Roseline Barbs. And the winner is, out of 160 eligible users... Oh, wait. Got to do this. There we go. The winner is... Pew Fish Zone, Pew Fish Zone, or P-E-W Fish Zone, perhaps. You have been drawn, so you have a minute and a half to chime in. Let us know you're here. That's really weird. That countdown is not going. Usually this countdown goes. 
Um, just go ahead. You've got a minute and a half to let us know you're here, and um, and you will have won. Orange cones, Pogo stem and stilatus needs a trim. Oh yeah, for sure. This is my hairdo right here. My nice green rocking hairdo. Boom. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, I've been meaning to get to that for weeks, but this week is uh, all I've done. Well, I've done a lot, but what I've been really focused on is uh, getting everything listed so I can actually list it this Friday and Saturday as promised. So I have most of the listings built, but I've got to go and make sure that my inventory numbers are accurate and um, see if I can list some sizes on there and get some pictures up, things like that. So. Pew Fish Zone. Oh, you are here. Awesome. Pew Fish Zone. Congratulations. You have won three Rose Lion Barbs. Um, so if you'd send me an email, dan at dansfish.com, I need your first and last name and your mailing address, and I'll send those out to you next week. Congratulations. I think that's an awesome win. I think Rose Lion Barbs are pretty cool fish. All right, so that dropped us from 214 down to 202 user, uh, viewers real quick. So we know who's here for the party and who's here for the gifts. <laughs> who's here for the free food and who's here for the party, I guess. <laughs> Darlene stinks. Nine-week-old pepper quarries have been feeding a Apache community. Can I feed them frozen baby brine? Yeah, of course. When to add other foods and what kind? Um, so... You can start feeding other foods, yeah, pretty early on with quarries. They could have started a while ago. You just need to be able to remove uneaten food. So it helps if it's a bare bottom tank or a fine sand bottom where the food isn't going to go down. Like in gravel, it can be really hard because if you put food in there to sit out for the babies and they don't eat, um, I don't know, summer pasture or, or some kind of wafer or something, within quickly enough then it'll disintegrate and go down in the gravel i mean it can last for a few hours but at some point it's going to go just decompose in there and be a problem so if you have a bare bottom tank what i'll often do is i'll put whatever i want them to learn to eat say it's a sinking wafer or pellet or rapashi or whatever i'll feed what they usually eat baby brine shrimp or micro worms or whatever and then i'll add the new stuff in there and i'll just let it sit for a while and then i'll take it out before it you know becomes a problem and after a little while they'll learn to eat that stuff from a very young age they'll go and nibble on stuff and eat particulates off of wafers and pellets and all kinds of stuff so whatever you want to start feeding them I would go ahead and do it as long as it's not like not something bulky like a frozen bloodworm but something where they can suck off particulates and little pieces of it and nibble at it yeah that would be just great Brian Maramba, what do you feed your tiger gobies? They're so small. I had one eat a whole bloodworm tonight that I put in for the quarries. I thought the little guy was going to choke to death. Um, I feed tiger gobies bloodworms, but mine might be a little bigger than yours. They like frozen foods. They like live food. So frozen brine shrimp, frozen bloodworms, um, chopped up mysis shrimp. I like PE mysis. Um, Piscean Energetics. I think is the brand freshwater mysis from Canada. Um, they'll eat baby brine shrimp. They'll eat scuds. Even those small little, they can take scuds down, even those little tiger bar, uh, tiger uh, gobies. Um, but I haven't found them to be great at wanting to eat flakes and pellets and stuff. It kind of has to be frozen or live. Um, I did think that mine were eating pellets for a while, but I took a closer look later and saw that they were just kind of sucking them in and spitting them out. They were tricking me. They weren't really eating. There are miniature blood worms, so if the ones you have are too big, maybe try the mini variety. Paul Soltero, oh yeah, that's the uh, pencil fish eating differently comment, which is spot on, absolutely. Mega Mindy Lou, did you say someone was breeding the head standers? Thankfully, three of mine made it through the great Texas freeze. It was about four days before we got back up to temp. Curious about breeding. No, um, I was saying that someone was breeding the Farawellas um, and had head standers in with them. But, yeah, Orange Cones, are you breeding the head standers too? I can't remember. I, 
I might be mixing you and Mega Mindy Lou up, but um, I know someone is breeding them. Is that orange cones? I can't remember for sure. I think it is. Blue Ice Aquatics, can you have archers and rainbow fish together? Absolutely. Um, just make sure it's a freshwater archer like uh, like these guys, the Blythei. There's two species of archers that I'm aware of that do okay in pure fresh water. The Blythei or the Burmese Clouded Archer or Leopard Clouded Archer, there's so many names for them, but um, Toxotis Blythei is the scientific name. They're pretty much available, you can find them. The other one, and I'm going on memory here, so I could be wrong, but I believe the other one is the small scale archer, and I don't know if I've ever seen that uh, for sale. Um, yeah, so I, I think that the Burmese clouded archer is the one to get. The rest of them really kind of need brackish water for long-term care, as far as I've ever heard and experienced. I'm not an expert on archers, but that's, that's what I understand about them. Sean, a.k.a. Oli Fish Guy. Hello from Olympia, Washington. Good to see you. Just got the snails today. Thanks again and just wanted to let you know I found one Pictus in the Mabuna tank while cleaning. Sorry for being late. I'm glad you found, I'm glad you got one in there. Um, and thanks to Dennis for providing the snails, and I'm glad they arrived in good shape. Kayla's Aquatics throwing down $10. Bob, thank you so much. Always appreciated. Never required, but as you know so well, it does make the wife super happy. Orange cones, does that mean there are ninja gobies out in the creek? Oh, yeah, they would they would not survive out there. It is, it's iced over. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, the ninja gobies, I'm sure, perished, and I feel horrible about that. Toad Tamer, would a Sikiopus Zoster, okay, I can't say this word. Zosteriforum be good with Stiphodon ornatus? Absolutely, they would. And do they only get breeding colors with females in the tank? I know females can be hard to find. Um, no, mine mine had pretty nice colors. Um, it wasn't necessarily as bright orange or red as you see in some of the pictures, but some of those pictures, I swear, they've been modified. Um, someone's taken the saturation and vibrance and just went whoop! And you can kind of tell when the color bleeds outside the lines <laughs> that it's been doctored a little bit. Or maybe their cameras just, you know, some of those pictures are a little unrealistic. But even without females in the tank, um, I've seen males color up because they still want to impress each other and say, get out of my territory, even if there are no females. Uh, with females, they might, they might color up better, I don't know, but... That's a good looking fish no matter what though, honestly. Even when they're not colored up, you still get that nice wash in there. And when they do fire up, it just becomes a little more prominent. T-Shot, would three rose lines be okay in a 55 gallon planted? Yeah, absolutely. There are nine dwarf rainbows and an SAE for them to school with. Yeah, I've heard so many different things about rose lines in a 55. I think a four foot tank is fine for some rose line barbs, especially if you only have three of them. Um, I think T-Shot, that what people might be referring to is that Roseline barbs get, I don't know, four inches or so, and they're strong swimmers, and they do best in large groups. So ideally, it would be a tank big enough for that. Um, but I've kept them long-term in 75-gallon tanks with no issues, and they didn't seem stressed. They seem to have swimming room and all that. Um, they do, though, seem to just thrive a little extra amount in this tank. This is a six foot long tank, but I, I don't think that a four foot tank is cruel or anything like that for a rose line barb. Um, now, other folks, if you think differently or have more to add to that, um, feel free to chime in, but in my experience, I think a four foot tank is fine. Mains, tails, fur, and fins at Dance Fish. Uh, thank you for being such a big part of this community. Oh, you're welcome. There's a lot of people that do this, so I'm just one of many. And I'm, I'm just privileged that I can do it and that uh, folks show up. <laughs> it still blows my mind that <laughs> I can just get on camera to talk about fish and folks appear. It's great. But thank you. I, I appreciate that. All right, I'm waiting for chat to jump because I think it's going to. Do I have to refresh or something? 
Oh yeah, it jumped and I didn't see it. I was like, there is no way I reached the bottom of the chat. <laughs> it jumped, but it didn't do its normal like shake thing. It just did it smoothly. So I missed it. So hang on, I'm just scrolling up to find where it jumped to. This is the worst part of streaming, is that chat will randomly jump and uh, you can't just go at your own pace. It literally, f it's a force function. Because <laughs> I guess YouTube thinks that being right up at the front of the chat is the only way to do it. Not me. I'll walk as fast as I want. <laughs> I might hike slow, but I can hike all day. <laughs> Mitchell Broom, I need to take a pic of them, but the better brown worm I got from you all have their tails healed up. Yeah, awesome. I'm glad they're doing well. Um, and I, you know, I only picked the ones with the most healed up tails, tails before I sent them. There's some that are still quite ratty. So as, as I see like, oh, okay, there's eight in there that have good tails, I'll list them, sell those, and then I'll wait a little bit and be like, it looks like there's another group that's recovered and I'll sell them. It, they all recover at their own pace. But I'm glad to hear, um, Mitchell, that they're colored up and doing well for you. They are a beautiful fish. RB animals and collectibles. Thanks. I will check your store out. All right. You're welcome. Candy listing my email so that the winner can email me, dan at dancefish.com, with their first and last name and mailing address, please, so I don't have to go looking through old records to find it. Orange cones. I was recently told by a fraud, oh, no, by a friend that I had a big problem with the head standers. Obvious swim bladder issues going on. <clears throat> Glad she cared enough to mention it. So I, I'm imagining those were females full of eggs because I think your headstanders are doing great, right? So I'm guessing I'm guessing they're just fat and sassy. I'm hoping. <laughs> Orange goes, no office desk scissors for the plant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do tend to trim plants like a lawnmower. <laughs> Calling me out. It's fair. Jedediah, is that Gull or Gwil? I'm going with Gwil. I'm sorry if that's wrong. Jedediah Gwil, my female Crebenzis has been in her cave for three days now. How long before she brings out the babies? It depends on temperature and things, but a couple days for the eggs to develop, a few days for them to become free swimming. I'd be surprised if they aren't out five or six days after um, after they were laid. But be aware, she can be in there for a while before she actually lays as well. So unless you've seen the eggs, just because she's hanging out in there doesn't mean that um, they've already been laid. But this depends on, on temperature. Higher temperature and higher oxygen concentration, the eggs will develop quicker and the fry will develop quicker. Lower temperatures, or lack of oxygen, and everything will slow down a bit. Jerry Serple Morris, I have a ton of female blue panda endlers, but not many males. I know environmental factors can influence this, but should I wait a while to see if they even out? They're in an indoor pond. So with, oh man, I haven't looked into this in so long, but if I remember right, I think temperature plays the role in the um, sex ratios of guppies and probably endlers as well. What I'm trying to remember is if I've actually read a scholarly study on that or heard it from someone whose word I can take is, you know, kind of as gospel, or if I'm just repeating a myth that I have heard over and over and over and I can't remember. So it might be worth looking into, Googling a bit, but it might be that if you tweak your temperatures, you might get different sex ratios. Um, it's something I want to say is true, but, but I can't remember my source right now. So it might just be spreading a rumor. I'm not sure. Okay, orange cones. I see spawning activity, but no head stand or fry so far. Okay. All right. So they're playing, but they're not paying yet. 
Bunny Viper. Hi, I missed last week. Hey, I'm glad you made it this week. Apparently, I'm addicted to my Wednesday night date. <laughs> the fishy date with the fishy fam. My angels are shredding my Amazon sores. Not sure if they just want the pond snail eggs. Any thoughts? Um, I guess my thought would be, are you seeing them mess with the plants and assuming that's happening or are they actually doing it? In my experience, I don't think I've ever had angels shred healthy plants, but if the plants are starting to decompose a bit or, or getting soft or anything, then they might get shredded. But I've never had angelfish abuse healthy Amazon sword plants in my experience. So I'm not sure. Um, it's kind of like that thing where I, you'll often hear, hey, my snails are destroying my plants, they're eating them. And it's kind of like, no, they're probably not. The plants are probably dying. And then the snails are eating the dying plant material. But healthy plant material, they don't they don't tend to bother. I'm talking about like ram's horn snails. I don't know. There might be some monster snail out there just munches everything. But um, So Bunny Viper, I'm not sure. I have not experienced that. I'm not saying they're not doing it. Uh, but I would be curious after like close observation if the plant is healthy and they're destroying it or if it's just kind of falling apart and they're picking at it and it's so it's easily just falling apart when they do. Um, those are my thoughts. Not a huge plant expert, but I have kept Amazon swords with angelfish for long periods of time with no problems. Did we jump again? We did. Oh, we only have three more minutes. Okay. Let's do this. <laughs> this is going to be quick and dirty. Paul Soltero, I think rose lines will do fine in my 120. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. KS, do you have lemon tetras? Will you be getting them in again soon? I don't think I do. There might be a few stragglers for sale. If so, they're, they're on the website. But I think I sold out just the Bolivian orange lemon tetras this time. Um, and I won't be getting any more in anytime soon. Orange goes, she thought they were sick and couldn't orient properly. Had to explain how headstanders are angled to swim. Oh, okay. So it wasn't that they were so fat. It's that they were standing on their heads and she thought they had swim bladder. That makes total sense. Yep, yep. That's funny. <laughs> That's actually really funny. Swamp Thing, Clausiuensis I had problems with has already been replaced with a single fry glowing up in the Clausio tank. The adults leave the fry alone, but this little guy eats hungrily Hungrily eats his siblings, yes. So I've experienced this with rainbow fish, where in a nice planted tank where there's hiding spots and stuff, um, I'll get some fry out and they'll start growing up and once they get a certain size, no more new fry appear. And it's just because they've got big enough to eat their little baby brothers and sisters. And so what I see happening when I look at those tanks long term is, those little babies grow, it's, uh, they get to a certain adult size, um, sub-adult maybe, and then new fry start appearing because now they're grown out of, you know, they're too big to get all in the plants and eat all the babies. So I've seen that cycle where small baby fish will eat their little brothers and sisters for a while and then they'll get big enough to where the next batch can thrive. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've got one baby growing up there. Um, Jerry Serpil Morse, I had a tub set up without fish in it for a few months. It's got a large amount of floating plants and mold. Should I clean it out a little before adding fish? I, I would, especially if it's just been kind of sitting there. And hopefully it has some filtration and water movement. Um, for quarantine especially, I would get organics out. So anything that's kind of decomposing in the tank. Um, and there's all kinds of mold. There's like fresh mold, which is like, you know, actively decaying stuff. And then there's that super old mold that's kind of pretty much inert. I'm not sure what kind you're describing here, but I would say that with a new fish that needs quarantine, giving them a clean environment really helps. I would get all that extra decaying organic stuff out of there personally. Last one. And then we're going to shut it down because it's time. It's 8.30. Jackson Tax, my endlers and guppies seem to have temperature effect male-female ratio. Also, some types seem to have more of one gender than the other. So certain strains tend to have one more, more gender, <laughs> one of more gender than the other in Jackson Tax's experience. And temperature seems to affect it. Yeah, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's all anecdotal, though, until there's actually a study done with controls and measurements. So I get that. Um, 
I, you know, there's lots of things I see and I'm like, hey, I observed that. And so a lot of our knowledge is anecdotal and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just trying to remember if there was like, a, I, I swear there was some kind of article or something that I read because I, I kept hearing it and I wanted to see if it was true. But it was so long ago that I can't remember for sure. So I just don't want to be the guy that spouts myth and lore <laughs> and common knowledge as truth without backing it up. So I just want to be, be fair and say I can't remember for sure if it's actually true or not. But that's what I remembered. All right, with that, we're going to close this out. I want to thank my moderators because they're amazing. Thanks for being here every week and doing what you do. I appreciate each and every one of you for the service you provide me and this community. Um, it helps in every way as me personally as I try to grow this business and things in the community um, for sure. If Punchy Paints is going next, then I want to throw people her way. She often goes about half an hour after I finish. So Punchy, let me know. If, oh, Pam is next. So Punchy Paints is going next. There's a link from Candy Overhaul, so go check her out. She'll be there in about half an hour. Um, thanks for the Super Chats, folks. Thanks for all the great conversation. All the fish that we talked about and looked at earlier in this video will be available Friday, hopefully Saturday at the latest. I will be back next Wednesday, 7 p.m., same bat time, same bat channel. Until then, I hope you have a good one. Oh, wait, I forgot. I forgot. All you lurkers, I'm with you. Hail the Lurker Nation. If you're watching on the replay, hope you can be here live sometime. Until next time, have a good one. Bye-bye.